Kids as young as 11 have already tried drugs as powerful as cocaine, meth, and heroin. They might tell themselves to only try a drug once, but the reality is many find themselves under persistent peer pressure to join the party and thus continue to experiment with drugs. A common problem here is that very few addicts recognize when they have crossed the line from casual use to addiction. Discovering that a teen is using drugs or alcohol can be a scary experience for parents. Many feel alone, ashamed, guilty, and confused about what to do next. Today, teen panelists will join me to discuss their personal stories about their addictions and their hard work to successfully accomplish recovery. And later on in our broadcast, we'll talk with an expert on teen addiction. Stay tuned for Recovering from Addiction, The Kid's Perspective. Hello, I'm Stan Rhodes, and welcome to our broadcast, Recovering from Addiction, The Kid's Perspective. Today, we have three teenagers who know all too well the past world of addiction and, thankfully, the present world of recovery. All of them began using drugs as young as 13 years of age. They certainly have remarkable stories to share with us, so let me introduce them to you. First, Scott, who is age 17, began abusing drugs at the age of 14. He has now been clean in a recovery and aftercare program for nine months. Nick, who is 17 years old, began the drug abuse at the age of 15. Nick has been in a residential treatment program for five months. And Garrett is 16 years of age and has been in a residential treatment program for two months for his addiction that started at the age of 13. Well, welcome, guys. I'm glad you're here on the broadcast, and I want to say right up front, I applaud you for doing what you're doing today, and that is taking the opportunity to try and share your stories with other people who are watching. And if you reach just one person, well, that's great. Hopefully we're going to reach more people than that. But what I want to do is I have just met you, but I don't know what happened to you. I'd like to know just briefly what happened, what, what started this off. And I'll tell you what, Nick, why don't you tell me what started? You were how old when you started abusing and what did you abuse? I was uh, 15 the first time I started to um, use drugs. My first drug that I ever tried was uh, weed. Mm -hmm. Marijuana. Started, yeah. Mm -hmm. I started smoking weed the uh, first time I ever smoked was at a concert with a whole bunch of my friends from school. And uh, it just kind of went on from there. I really enjoy had a good time at the concert, and, you know, it was just something that I like to do in my free time. And so it went on from there from just going from smoking on the weekends to after school, and then it just became a, a regular daily thing for me. So it, it went to other things, though. Yeah. After weed... Um, I enjoyed that, but I just was having a lot of fun with that, so I wanted to try different things. I wanted to see what else was out there. You wanted to expand your horizon on that. Pretty okay. much. Right. Scott, how about you? How old were you? Uh, 14. 14? Yeah. And what was it you started with? Uh, marijuana as well. Mm -hmm. I was at school, and a drug dealer just came up casually, asked me if I wanted anything. At school? At school, in the middle of class, and I uh, said, yeah. Started you, off you, there Yeah. and uh, took off. A few weeks later, went to like a birthday party type deal, and they were drinking there, and so I thought I'd already, uh, yeah, I'd already smoking, might as well. And after that, it just like immediately, just like more friends from it. At school, it was just recognized and made me think I was more of the cool kid now. You had a new circle of friends. Yeah, a whole new circle, more friends and every, and everything. So I just started doing during school before school, after school, and just took on like the whole lifestyle. Yeah, at that I point guess. you just found you couldn't stop. Yeah. You it were hooked just, on it. Yeah. yeah. Garrett, how about you? What, how old were you when you first started? I started using drugs at age 13. 13. You're 16 now. Yeah, I'm 16. Okay. And, and what was it that you started? The first drug I ever did was Vicodin. Okay. So, how, and, and why Vicodin? Was it just available um, to you? My brother was uh, selling drugs at the time and that's what he was selling, and he kind of convinced me into doing it. But, uh, I mean, I was doing it to fit in. He was with a bunch yeah. of his older friends that 
I looked up to. Mm. So I took it, and from there on, I mean, there's an occasional use of marijuana, alcohol, mm -hmm. but strictly opiates, pretty much. So you started with that, then you kind of a mixture of all, all things. Yeah, pretty much. Scott, let me come back to you. You had mentioned that you started this in school, that a drug dealer came. Yeah. Was this somebody who was your age, a student, or was this, it was somebody who was yeah, your age? Yeah, it was a fellow student in one of my classes, and I knew him before, too. I didn't think that he even sold drugs or anything. Really? We weren't friends, but we knew each other, uh -huh. and just one day he came up and asked me if I wanted some weed, I guess. So it turned into all of this. For all of you, it was more than, it started with what, this kind of a little experimenting and then blossomed into other things? Yeah. It was more exactly. than just experimenting? Or is that what you thought you were doing, was just experimenting, Gary? Pretty much. I didn't know later on down the road that I was going to get as bad as I was or did. So. And your brother, was he using as well, abusing? Yeah, he was. Um, do you think your, your parents saw any signs of you using anything, Nick? Oh, my mom knew I smoked weed, but I didn't think she recognized any of the signs. Like, I, I think I did a pretty good job of hiding it from her. You know, I never used it when I was, like, around her. Mm -hmm. I would always go to somebody else's house where I knew it was all right to use. I never um, tried to bring it in the house, or if I did, I was real uh, sneaky about it. So I always tried to like stay undercover mm -hmm. when I was using. You don't think she ever knew or could sense or smell or see anything different in you that you were different? Um, maybe in the beginning but towards the middle of uh, me using and abusing drugs I think it just she thought that was normal she thought that's just how I was but really it was I was abusing drugs. I want to come back and find out something regarding hiding places but first let me move on Scott you tell me uh, the, the same situation. Do you think you were hiding this from your parents? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, immediately I just started stashing it at my house. At your house? Yeah. Uh, Visine a lot, but after probably a few months of using, I got caught with uh, weed at my house and uh, some alcohol. And since then, I've been caught so many times. And after every single time, I told them I quit. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it anymore. It's not worth it. Yeah. But that would just mean that I had to find a better hiding spot. Uh -huh. I just would uh, hide it better, use more visine. Gary, how'd you hide this from your parents? Well, I mean, they were more focused on my brother because he was battling addiction before I even started, and he was getting into the midst of trouble. So it took them almost a year to find out that I was even using. So, I mean, I didn't really have to hide too much until my first failed drug test that they surprised me with. Did so, they surprise your parents surprised you? Yeah, my dad. Yeah. And from then on, I don't know, I started getting a little bit more sneaky about it, finding ways to like falsely pass a drug test. Yeah. And after you, a while, did you falsely pass the test? Yeah, a couple of times, like couple using times. other pr people's urine and stuff. So did your parents think, well, you're you're? Yeah, playing. they thought I was doing better. Thought you were doing better. Mm -hmm. Where would you hide your your stuff? Hmm? Where, where, what kind of places did you hide? Uh, my room, my clothes. Things under... where your mom wouldn't normally look if coming yeah, in. Yeah, definitely. Basically in like hiding spots like pockets of your pants, f under other pants, like in my drawers. Did you hide in other places in the house? Where, such as where, where would you hide? How, uh, how about? Sometimes I would stash it in the garage. Uh-huh. Uh, put in shoe boxes. We had uh, some lunch boxes out in another room mm -hmm. that no one used, put them in there. Uh, back room, just wherever I see that they wouldn't go or that they usually don't go. So kind of like in plain sight, it could have even been right under their nose, maybe even yeah, in their own bedroom. It was, and uh, they didn't find, they found some of it, but not all yeah. of it. And, and your parents, they find it as well? Um, no, actually, me and my mom have this trust for each other. Like, she doesn't, I could put it in my drawer and she wouldn't, she doesn't go through my things. But after a while of that, yeah. I was afraid that people were going to start breaking into my house. And so I bought a safe and actually started keeping it in a safe. And that didn't put off any alarm bells for your mom or your parents at all? No, because yeah. I had the safe hidden in my closet under, you know, like a trash bag with clothes uh, in it and stuff. Okay. So it wasn't just out in the open. I don't even think she knew I had the safe for a while. Mm. Let's, let me ask you about now at school. 
did your grades change? Did your grades get any better? Did they get any worse? What was that another alarm for your parents? Well, at first they started getting a little better. I don't know because opiates made me concentrate a little bit more. I don't know why. So they gave you kind of like a more of a, a false. A little bit, but then I'd start skipping a lot of school to get the drugs, and the absentees would drop my grades, and attendance would get worse. Scott, how about you? Uh, yeah, pretty much just stop caring, stop doing work, more hang out with the people and just talk, talk about drugs all day during school. Try and so, find them. Try, yeah, trying yeah. to find them, talking about what you can get, where you get it, and so just there's no attention towards work, so my grades, I mean my grades yeah. dropped. Like, you had mentioned in the very beginning that you had gotten started on marijuana from a dealer that yeah. was a student. So you, you found yourself having a new circle of friends. Was that the same for you, Gary? Yeah, I started hanging out with a lot of fellow drug users. I stopped. I started to stop hanging out with hanging out with friends that I could trust, people that liked me for who I was, not because of my drug connections or because yeah. I get high with them. This has to cost some money. How did you find the money? Did, how, did you earn it? Did you steal it? What, what, what happened? What did you, you do? Um, at first, usually I would tell my mom I was going out to dinner, go to a movie or something like that. Along so she'd give lines. you what? 10, so 20 me, yeah, 10, 20 dollars here and there. And then uh, sometimes I would just save my lunch money, you know, I get five dollars a day for lunch. Mm -hmm. well, I would just save that. And uh, I, used to, I had on and off jobs here at a um, sandwich shop and, you know, working with my stepdad on the weekends, doing stuff around the house for money. So you, you had a, a means of which to go and pay for what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Scott, how about you? Uh, started off pretty much the same way, uh, saving lunch money. Money from your... Yeah, what do yeah. you eat, tell them I was doing things. But then as the, uh, the addiction grew, so did the cost, so I needed a little something more. Started uh, stealing from even family members, stealing things from friends, like you iPods. Mean, you know, iPods, other things. Yeah. What were you doing then, taking into a uh, hot... Well, you could take someone's iPod and just sell it to kid, other kids Another at school, kid. and that's uh, money right there. But then I started uh, actually selling weed just so I could smoke all the weed that I wanted. And so, so you became a dealer? Yeah. I actually uh, hooked up with the first person that sold me weed, and uh, me and him kind of got together for a while, and then I started off on my own thing. Was it just uh, alcohol and, and marijuana for you guys, or or did you also do opiates? At that point, it was just marijuana and alcohol. But it escalated. Yeah, later on it got worse. What did it get worse? What uh, did you same do? thing, opiates, things like that. Uh, so when we say an opiate, what, what do you mean? What do you mean, so I know? Uh, Roxy's, Oxycontin, it got on the other pills too, Xanax and alcohol together. Yeah. A lot of things like that. Triple C's. But those are pretty strong drugs, aren't they? Yeah. How, how would you get How would you get those? Dealers. They're that prevalent and available. Around. Yeah. You can you can find them that easily, mm -hmm. uh, at school or or wherever you would circle go to. Yeah. Wow. Did your parents try to do anything to prevent you from doing what you were doing, or did, or did you just hide it so well that they it was too late before they knew? You know, I was getting uh, I got arrested a few times for um, possession of marijuana and every time I got arrested you know I would tell my mom I'm gonna stop you know this is it I don't ever want to go through that again yeah. but really I would stop for you know maybe a couple of days and then just go back out and do the same thing and just uh, try to figure out better ways to hide it from her you know so by the time she did realize that it was a problem it was you know too late what was your worst experience from that um I actually got a DUI and uh, I wasn't high on weed. I was actually um, messed up on Xanax. And so it wasn't from alcohol. It was from Xanax. Yeah, I wasn't okay. drunk. I was um, impaired from Xanax. I asked my friend because she was messed up, and I trusted. My logical thinking was that well, but I you were okay. You yeah, were. I can trust myself to drive. I'd rather me drive than her. So I asked her to give me the keys, and I would drive her. Well, we ended up driving about 20 minutes, and. Um, I was probably 200 yards away from my house, and I was stopped. And I really don't remember much of the situation, but uh, where'd you charged. go? What happened? They lock you up? Yeah, um, I don't remember being locked up. All I remember is waking up the next day and, you know, trying to think: was that a dream or did that really happen? 
So I call a few people and ask them what happened last night and then um, talk to my mom about it. And it turns out, you know, I had been arrested and charged with the DUI in possession of marijuana. I'm going to spend just a little more time with this. How, how did you feel about that when you sobered up, when you came to in the jail? I felt, well, I see, I didn't sober up when I was in the jail. I didn't no. really wait, like wake up and realize what had happened. You were still? I was, I was still messed up in jail. Okay. So when I was at home is when it kind of, I felt kind of like lost and I didn't remember anything. I didn't know, hmm. you so know, I didn't, didn't even, have any consequences for you at that time. Yeah. Not until the next day when I had to go back to court for yeah. you. And so I was trying to figure out, you know, I couldn't even remember if I had my seatbelt on or not. I couldn't tell you if the headlights were on, if, you know, what I was doing. I couldn't believe that I had actually made it to my house from where I was at. Do you remember if it was day or night? Um, well, I know I, what time I got arrested at, but I don't remember driving, anything like that. Hmm. Interesting. Here, yeah, what's, uh, what's been your worst experience through all of this? The worst experience for me probably was when I got caught selling my brother's prescription at school and they put me in handcuffs and arrested me and did all that and they expelled me from my school and I mean my mom came and picked me up and she was crying and I never really saw her in that bad state of mind and that really got to me were you conscious of that of what she was actually going through or were you still under the influence no I wasn't under the influence which probably made the whole scenario a lot worse at the time but so yeah, you saw yeah. how hurt she was? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, and that, that really got to her. Yeah, and uh, the person that I sold my brother's prescription to, which was Suboxone, it's kind of like methadone, mm -hmm. and uh, I sold it to my best friend, and he went to the hospital and almost overdosed and died. From so, that? Yeah, and uh, his parents were getting press charges on me, so that really got to me, too. I can't even go to his house anymore, and at one time we were best friends, so... So there's been some bridges that have been burned from this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Scott, what about you? What's, so far, what's, what's the worst experience of this? Uh, getting out of jail early, and I was so happy just to find out that I had to go to a residential program. But you were in jail for, uh, you were arrested for what? Uh, battery, possession of weed, and projecting a deadly missile, because I got in a fight. And Did it make you violent? Yeah, well, my friend was actually getting jumped, but we were all really drunk, and so I uh, stepped in, and I don't even, they gave me a felony charge for throwing rocks, and I don't, I could have sworn that I never threw a rock or anything like that. Because you didn't remember that? Yeah, I, I didn't even, I didn't believe them when they told me I did, and so hmm. I got out early. I didn't even think I'd be going to jail because it was two on one, and I stepped in to save my friend. After, and that, I was on probation when that happened, so I guess my charges kept escalating because I had a few charges before that. Got out and they told me I was going to residential and I, I knew some kids from it. And I knew it wouldn't be quick. I knew I'd be in there for a while. And that sucked. Well, I appreciate all that you have told me. We're going to take a break because I want to talk to you about the recovery side of this. Obviously, we've talked about the dark side but we want to talk about the recovery side of recovering from addiction, the kid's perspective. Stay with us. Hey, son. So, you're turning 13, becoming a man. Your hormones are surging, starting to notice the girls. You know, maybe your body's doing some funny things. So, you want to talk? Or we could talk about drugs. Yeah, let's talk about drugs. There's no wrong way to talk to your kids about drugs. Need help? Get help. Visit our website at drugfree.org. And welcome back to Recovering from Addiction, the Kids Perspective. Uh, Nick, Garrett, and Scott have shared very powerful and extraordinary stories, and we're in a moment going to talk about the recovery, but I just want to wrap up uh, our first segment just a little bit and ask, did you guys ever tell your parents everything? No. No? No. No. Mm. Okay, it's unanimous. <laughs> okay. Where did the use of MySpace and Facebook fit in with your activities? Did you use it at all? Yeah, I have a MySpace. Was it part of your drug activity? Not so much. I just used it to 
conversate with my friends and stuff. I mean, I talk about drugs on there, but not that bad. But you weren't using it to sell or or buy from? A little bit. Okay. All right. So, to, and, and Scott, how about you? Yeah, same. Same I thing? I talked to certain people. Some people didn't have phones or just house phones. So yeah, instead way of calling kind of their around. house, it was easier just to talk to them online. So did you use, uh, did you kind of, were you, sort of typically, were you kind of being sneaky about what you were doing and saying? So yeah. if your parents did check? Yeah. Okay. Well, my parents didn't know I had a MySpace. They didn't want me to have one, so I kind of okay. had to sneak on MySpace. Uh -huh. How about you? Uh, for the longest time, my mom didn't even know I had a MySpace. And I didn't really, like, sell or buy drugs from MySpace because I knew, you know, law enforcement could see that. I mean, it's not private. Right. So, but I would keep in contact with people I use with, you know, what are you doing, let's hang out, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Did any of you use cocaine? Yeah, I did. You did? Yeah. It was probably two years after I first started smoking weed, I got into cocaine. Did you ever do anything purposely to get caught, hoping that, man, I've got to get out of this, I've got to try and get on the road to recovery? How about you, Gary? Mm, not so much, no. Not purposely. No, not purposely. But you did get caught. Yeah, I've been caught. Yeah. Scott? Yeah, on accident. I never, want, I never wanted to get caught. Didn't want to get caught. Nick? Uh, that was my whole goal was not to get caught, and it completely backfired on me. Let's talk about recovery, because I don't know what you're going through to recover, but I do applaud you guys for getting to that point, and I, I really hope that you continue on. As I said, if you reach one person, well... That's great. How has recovery been for you? What, what's the process been for you, Gary? Um, well, this is my second time in a residential program. Your second time? My second time. The first time, I would just not, I wasn't taking it seriously. I relapsed in the program and then left, which is AWOL, and they kicked me out. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I was there long enough to know enough to not relapse on the outs and get quite as bad, but that wasn't true for me. I got a little worse than what I was before I went in there. And uh, this time around, I've been focusing a lot more on my treatment and I feel that I'm doing better. Is that something you had to come to your own realization? That you had to, you had to make that decision? There's nobody who could, who could push you or anything? You had to do it yourself? Oh yeah, I knew that I needed help. It you was, knew you came to yeah, that I was getting to the point where I woke up every morning and the first thing on my mind was to get high, to get my to get my drugs for the day. So you knew you had to make that 180 right. degree turn and go another direction. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, how about you? Uh, pretty much the same. Got into uh, the residential center and spent some months in there. I got out actually. Now I'm doing aftercare there, where I come in every week and check up, do drug tests, mm -hmm. and all that. But, but it wasn't successful in the beginning? Oh, no, it was, yeah, I got out in uh, five months successfully. I completed the program uh, real well. Got out, was doing real good. Uh, relapsed once after I got out. Uh, I had to tell my counselor and everyone, my family. That was kind of hard. But uh, since then, I've been doing a lot better, too. Nick? Uh, I'm still in treatment. At first, I, I wasn't really cooperating. Like, I was just going to tell whatever they wanted to hear just so I could get by and then you know after get being, by and get out yeah and after being in there for a while you know you start to think about you know what they're telling you and then I started to realize I did have a problem because I wasn't only hurting myself I was hurting all the people around me is rehab important yes it's very important if you have a problem then mm -hmm. you know that that's about the only way that you can fix it you saw somebody else going through what you went through would you recommend what you're doing right now, your rehabilitation process? Yes. To them? You said you relapsed. Mm. Does that happen often? I think so. They say it's a part of getting clean and that it's a step. Not everybody will relapse, but I did, and I know people that have and either have kept going that way or that have turned it around. So, I mean, it goes both ways. So if you take a couple of steps forward and you might have a step backward, it's important that you're... Yeah. Doing more steps forward. Mm -hmm. What do you like about what you're doing right now with rehab? What's, what are the strong things that are changing you as a young man? Um, I feel that I'm going to be more responsible when I get out. I'll be able to hold down a job. 
GPA will be steady, maintain some relationships with friends instead of them constantly changing because of my drug habit. Um, the, I'll be more responsible with money. Won't always be spending it on drugs. I'll have a bank account. So you're focused on the future? Yeah, definitely. What, what does that future hold for you, do you think? Um, college? Yeah, definitely. I want to go to college when I get out of high school. Next year I'll be a junior, so I still got two years, but mm -hmm. I mean, I'm definitely at least trying to get a four-year degree. How about your rehab experience, Scott? Uh, I mean, have you, let me ask you first this. Have you had to cut off your connection with your past, with your drug friends from the past? Yeah, certainly. I'll go back to you, Gary, and we'll come back around. What, my drug connection? Yeah. Yeah, I, I plan to not hang out with really any of the people that I did before I went in. Are any of them in recovery programs or doing like, rehabilitation? I think one. You think one? Yeah, and it's outpatient. He's not living there. Okay. So, I mean, he might be doing good. I haven't talked to him. But, I mean, the first time, one of the big problems for me was because I went out and I started hanging out with the same people didn't really change anything and I believe that you need to do that in order to be successful and mm -hmm. recover fully. And how's your your parents with this? Um, well they're just they're happy that I'm in treatment and that I'm really trying to get clean for good this time and we're working on our trust issues. Is that a big thing? Trust issues? Yeah definitely. Do you think you built some bridges with your parents? Oh yeah. They still don't believe some of the things I say which bothers me, but I know it'll take some time. Do you understand why they don't believe you? Yeah. I mean, I've done some pretty bad things in the past, yeah. and yeah. Yeah. Scott, how about you? Uh, yeah, you have to find out who your real friends are, I guess, instead of just your drug buddies. But did you have to cut off some people? I mean, have you yeah, just totally definitely. cut off connection with, with some of the people in the past? Yeah, my, uh, probably one of my best friends known him since third grade can't talk to him ever again. Still, is this person still using? Yeah, bad. He actually, when I got out, told me he was doing real good. Told me he wasn't smoking, wasn't doing anything like that. But Find he was. out from other people. Yeah, he's just lying to me. Still trying to be my friend, but he's not really a friend. Same with the kids that say that they're my friend, but they consistently bring drugs around me. Because I'm back at school now, and there's just people that you used to hang out with and they don't really care about your own recovery. They just want to get you high or go use drugs like they used to, but they aren't your friends. So what kind of tools are you, do you have that you didn't have, that you have now, to it's, help you in an environment where you're still around some of the same people who abuse and use? Well, they talk a lot about the support system. Mm -hmm. uh, it consists of my counselor, parents, and uh, friends, like close friends that are good influences you just try to surround yourself around them but eliminate the negative and accentuate yeah, the positive exactly yeah I want to ask you the same question Nick but I want to also Scott follow up uh, having met you I know you have a younger brother I don't know if you have other siblings but you are you the oldest yeah I am the oldest do you see yourself as being a role model in your family yeah I feel bad actually because I had introduced him to that mm -hmm. at a young age. You, and I don't mean to heap that on top of you, but you, you see the significance of that. Yeah, by far, definitely. But you can set a positive example with your change, don't you, don't you agree? I hope, I hope what he sees me go through, he yeah, doesn't he want to do. repeat, yeah. It's not fun. It's not fun, no. Definitely not. Yeah, how, how, how about you? Have you had any relapses, Nick? Um, not yet, not since I've been in treatment, but before I got in treatment, you know, I would say I'm going to quit, mm -hmm. you know, quit using, quit using cocaine, and, you know. You're going to quit the drug, not yeah. the program. Yeah, I quit the drug, quit using drugs, and um, I tried to do it on my own, and I, I couldn't do it. I'd end up relapsing until, you know, I finally sought out residential help. How, give me an idea, if you were abusing marijuana or cocaine or uh whatever it might be, uh, OxyContin, whatever it might be. What was it, what was the tool that helped you to turn that switch off and say, you know, turn it to, from, yeah, I'm going to do it, to no, I'm not going to do it? 
um, just like really realizing how much you hurt other people. Like that was the switch for me is like seeing what I was doing to my mom, you know, seeing how it was affecting my family and what I was doing to other people, you know, because I was, I was hurting them more than I thought it was. And, you know, I got a little bit of a soft side and I don't want to hurt my mom, you know. Do you think you hurt her? Oh, in yeah, the big time. The things that, you know, stealing from her, you know, just lying to her, yeah. and just totally going off in the wrong direction. How has it been for you to rebuild the trust bridge with your parents? It's hard. I mean, with all the lying, the cheating, the stealing, you know, it, it takes a while, but you see little bits of it here and there, and it's actually a really good feeling to know that you're doing the right thing now and not lying to her about doing the right thing. It feels good to actually prove to her that, you know, you're not out going to get high. You're actually just going to see a movie. Have, have things changed? Garrett, in terms of, are you allowed to go out now, or are you uh, restricted in terms of what you can do, extracurricular activities? In the program? Yes. Um, I'll be going up for phase two of my treatment on Monday. Once you get that certain like level of accomplishment, you'll receive passes to leave. So I'm very close to leaving. And I've gone on some doctor's passes. I've left the building, and I've done pretty well with it. So that you're on a pass now to be here for this oh, yeah. for this interview. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Scott? Are you? Where are you? Uh, well, I'm out of the program now. Okay, you're out of the program. Yeah. So, so uh, Garrett is just following in your footsteps then. Yeah, exactly. And same thing with Nick then. Yeah. Okay. So you're out. How are you handling your freedom? Uh. Well, it's a lot different than before, especially because even though after you get out of the treatment program. You still have a curfew. You're still you still have a ton of restrictions that you can and can't do, but there's also freedom enough freedom for you to mess up, and they give you enough freedom that you can pretty much do what you want to do, and it makes it your choice. So, fellas, I'm interested to find out. Do you think drug addiction and what you've been through is and and, and you're young, 16, right? Mm -hmm. 17, 17, do you think that's a life sentence? You know, I think you can, you can beat it. It's not something, you know, I mean, you're always going to have that in you, but you don't have to be an addict, you know, you can be a recovering addict. So I, I guess what I mean by a life sentence, that you kind of have this on your shoulder that, yeah, go ahead and use this, go ahead and do this. You're constantly fighting that. Do you find that that is there, those urges? Yeah. Yeah. What do you do to fight off the urge? Not so much ignore it, but you can talk about it with like a trusted peer, a counselor. That's what I do. Um, so instead of keeping it inside, you're sharing it. Yeah, that, that helps a lot. That takes the weight off your shoulders, oh, doesn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. So how, how has it been with, with your counselors? Do you have a good reputation, I mean a good rapport with them? Do you yeah, trust them? I just had a counselor change. She went. She went elsewhere for work, but mm -hmm. I got a new counselor. But before that, yeah, I had a good relationship with her, and I was doing good. She knows everything. Do you find that you can share more with a counselor than you can with your parents? I'd say, yeah. Would you? Why is that? You just feel more relaxed? You don't want to feel bad about what you've done because you know that your parents care for you. And not so much that your counselor's a stranger, but you don't have that close relationship with them, like the love factor. It's kind of like embarrassing more to tell it to your parents. Mm -hmm. You feel bad about it. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need to worry about their reaction as much as you do with the, your parents. Do you blame your parents for their reactions, for your loved ones? No, uh, no. I think uh, all my mom's reactions were very called for like they were ex they should have been expected for what I was doing that they should have been expected yeah like I don't think it was anything out of the ordinary for her to react the way she did when all of this news kind of hit her at once could she have been more severe with you yeah she could have been would it have helped um I think it might have helped a little bit but I think I was probably still going to do, you know, what I was going to do. I was still going to use no matter what because I had tried to stop, you know, being arrested and going through that whole process, being on probation, being even in outpatient, um, you know, rehab programs, they didn't stop me. You know, I was still going out to use and that's what I was going to do.
you just had it in your mind you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. your, your will was just that strong you were going to do it regardless. Yes, no matter what. No matter what. How about your parents, Scott? Uh, well, they kind of forgave me for most of what I've done. Towards, uh, Are they trying well, to move to the future and forget? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Not, not necessarily forget the past, but yeah. move on. Take what you can out of it and leave it behind, I guess. They don't want to see me mess up again, so they do look and see uh, what I did with my old behaviors yeah. and try to catch on there so it's not like me manipulating them again. But how they acted, I completely expect it now. Back when I was using, like they'd get mad and it would just... I didn't respect them enough to care at the time. It was all about me. They didn't understand, blah, 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 things like that. But you got to understand where they're coming from. Sure. Let me ask you three before we conclude the second segment. If you were in a room with another guy that, or gal that's your age and, man, they've just been messed up on any kind of drug and whatever else, and knowing where you are right now, I'm going to start with you, Garrett. And you can relate to them. What would you tell them? If you could um, reach them, if you could reach out, what would you tell them? Uh, I'd tell them that, I mean, I'd offer them some positive advice on to why that he or she shouldn't be doing that. I don't, whether they'd listen or not isn't up to me. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, I tried. Because you've been there. Yeah, I've definitely been there. And I didn't listen to the advice that was told to me. So, I mean, to be honest with you. But look at where I'm at. So. That's great. Yeah. Scott, what would you tell someone? I tell them. Because there are people watching that will be watching who have been or struggling with the same things you have. What would you tell them? Uh, immediately go to some kind of 12 step meeting or support meeting. They have uh, Alcoholic Anonymous, Narcotic Anonymous, Gambling Anonymous, whatever their problem is. They even have, for younger people too, they have younger people groups. And uh, it's just, it's so much help you wouldn't even believe it. It's just an outside source that will be there for support. They don't try to change you at all, they just give you the tools to change yourself. Mm -hmm. It worked for me, so. Nick? You know, I, I would tell him, you know, I know you think you're probably having fun going out and getting high every day, but really that you're not enjoying life. You're spending all your time and money into looking for and getting drugs when really there's so much more to life than just getting high. You can, you know, you, there's so many different activities you can enjoy than getting high. And I would just, you know, ask that person to, you know, look inside and ask them if they're really having fun, you know. Great. Well, Nick, Scott, Garrett, I really appreciate you being here and having a very candid and honest conversation with me about this. I think you can reach a lot of people, and I hope that you do, and I wish you all the best, and I hope that uh, your recoveries continue on, and uh, who knows you, uh, where, where the future, what the future holds for the three of you. So I thank you very much for being here. Well, we're going to uh, take a quick break, and when we return... We'll talk with an expert who works with teens in recovery. Stay with us. Childproof caps don't work forever. Prescription drug abuse can kill. Talk to your teen. We've been best friends forever. Would you ever think I'd be the one doing drugs? One day, it could happen. If it does, I hope you stay away from me. And welcome back to Recovering from Addiction, the kid's perspective. Well, joining me on the broadcast now is Mary Ellen Evers, who is an administrator of juvenile services at Operation PAR. Mary Ellen has nearly 20 years of experience dealing with adolescence and addiction. Mary Ellen, you watched the first part of our mm -hmm. broadcast with the three fine young gentlemen that we had on here. Yeah. I want to talk with you about them, but I first want to find out how are you of help to them? What does Operation PAR do? What is Operation PAR? Operation PAR is a not-for-profit substance abuse um, program. They've been around, actually, Pinellas County, Florida, for almost 40 years, um, providing substance abuse recovery for people of all ages, 
from adolescents to where I work with, um, methadone treatment, outpatient counseling, residential services. You've been involved with counseling for 15, 20 years? 15, a little, well, between about 18 years altogether. 18 years. What kind of trends have you seen change in that time period? I mean, these boys are, well, we're talking 16, 17 years of age. So I started before they were born. Thank you. <laughs> and so did I. Uh, yeah. um, it's very different now. The drugs are different. The intensity of the drugs are different. Marijuana, when I was their age, is not the same marijuana that the adolescents are smoking now. Marijuana now is at times um, laced with embalming fluid, um, manure, urine. Um, it's this is in an effort to cut it and stretch it's it? A, it's, it creates a different potency. Mm -hmm. um, the adolescents nowadays are into a lot of pills. Pills are, are where the kids are using. Why is the trend moved from uh, the marijuana to the pills? Well, you know, marijuana is such the gateway drug. I think two of mm -hmm. the boys mentioned how they yes. just started at school with, with smoking weed. Right. Um, and then it progresses. The pills are so easy to get. Often we'll see kids whose parent or grandparent are on medication for medical issues mm -hmm. of their own, and the right. kids will go in the medicine cabinet. Go raid the medicine cabinet. They'll have farm parties. Uh, those do exist. Oh where everyone brings some pills and they throw them in a bowl and the kids just take them like candy. Now we've, I, I spent the first uh, portion of our program talking about their past mm -hmm. and then the second talking about the recovery. Mm -hmm. What did you think about what they said? Anything stand out to you or what, what kind of thoughts do you have? You know, it's, I don't want to say all the stories are the same because they're not. No. I always tell the, the, the kids that I work with, everyone comes in with their own luggage. Um, and everyone comes in with their own story that they mm -hmm. have to work through. Right. Um, but it is typical in the sense that it started casually and then, uh, you know, uh, grew up into a life of its own. Um, it's very common. The parents didn't know what was going on until a year or so later, sometimes even longer than that. I've heard it said that you may start in a different spot in the sink, but you all end, you end yeah, up going down the drain yeah. together. True. So very that's, true. Uh, do you think this is an addiction? Do you, do you see this as a, as a disease, what they are going through? Mm -hmm. I do, um, but there's so, much, so many more components to it you know, than just a disease um, because there's what goes on in the family and what goes on in school and with their friends. So to just say it's a disease, it's also a social disease mm -hmm. uh, besides just a, a disease of a person. Do kids tell their parents everything? Go, no. No, they don't tell their counselors everything. No. No, it takes time. It but takes... even though they have maybe a better relationship yeah. with the counselor. Yeah, it takes time to build the trust. It takes time to build the relationship to where the kid realizes that the counselor's not going to yell at them or judge them. Um, but, yeah, no, they don't tell their parents probably half of, of what goes on. Does the counselor become a bridge then back from the kid to their parents? In a way, yeah. Um, we become an advocate to help the, the adolescent share with their parents, work on getting honest and, and help rebuild that trust so that they can talk to their parents and work on being honest with them. Now, Operation PAR is a recovery program mm -hmm. and you have children, well, it could be children. What, could be. what ages? Uh, where I'm at, uh, it's called the Academy for Behavioral Change. Mm -hmm. We offer um, intervention level outpatient and residential for kids between the ages of 13 to 18. So teenagers primarily. But I have had a couple uh, 11 and 12 year olds who we've worked with. Hmm. They come in. Mm -hmm. and, and they come in with their own baggage as mm -hmm. you've said. Mm -hmm. And they're not ready to instantly be cleaned up. Not at all. So not do you find that the, they're hiding drugs and things and behaviors on you at, at the facility? Oh sure they will. Oh, sure. The behaviors are there. We're just mm -hmm. the new spot that they're at. Um, it's not a lockdown facility. We are not a lockdown facility, actually. In um, the Florida system, we're considered what's called a level two. Um, so we're not a lockdown. In our residential program, we work from the perspective of we're going to show them AA and NA, but we're also going to reteach them social skills, um, work with their behavioral issues. So many of the kids have been delayed in their emotional growth because of their drug use. They've missed that step altogether. They've missed that step. The brain hasn't developed. The brain really doesn't develop for people until they're about 21 for women, they're finding out now, and 23 for boys. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if a kid starts using drugs at the age of 13, his physical body may show me that he's a 17-year-old, right. but his frontal lobe development, his brain development, is truly that of a 13-year-old. Is that because of what they have done, how much yes. they have done? Yes. Can they get beyond that? Oh, sure. Or is it permanently it's not. No, it's not permanent brain damage. It's just a delayed growth of skills like how to problem solve, mm -hmm. um, understanding consequences, how to respond to anger and, and hurt and sadness. Because what's happened is for so many years, many of them have used to numb those feelings. Why do you, is, is there a primary reason why these kids have gone towards drugs? Is there something that is the magnet? Is there something missing in their lives? You know, I can't say there's one thing, again, because everyone has their own story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had kids I've worked with who have lost both parents, and they have turned to drugs to numb that pain. I've had kids who have done drugs with their parents, and that's their form of bonding. Um, their parents, their best friend, and they so do drugs with them. Mom, dad mm -hmm. does it, it's got to be okay. Sure, sure. Or if it's an older sibling. Or an older sibling, an aunt and uncle. Um, some kids have existing mental health issues. Uh, one that's not uncommon that I've seen is those who have attention deficit hyperactivity, ADHD. Mm -hmm. Very often, um, if left untreated, an adolescent will smoke marijuana because it gives, it the, gives them the same effect as a medication. So they, they go to that because it gives them the same effect of the medication. Slows them down. They have great grades. They're more focused. Interesting. It gives them very mixed messages. Sure. That smoking is okay because, look, I started smoking and my grades are going up. So how do you handle that with them? How do you, how do you get that message across to them? How do you sort out the messages and say, this is the right message, this right. is the wrong message? Right. In the residential end, it's a matter of usually the first month to six weeks watching the kids have their bodies and their minds clean out and then we can see what any type of symptoms we're really dealing with if there are mental health issues there um, we can see what feelings and emotions they're having more difficulty with and then it's just support rolling with their resistance kind of developing discrepancies with what they say and what they do mm -hmm. to help them see what their choices are and where they've led them mm -hmm. and support them with making better ones and I'll use the three gentlemen that were with us. Mm -hmm. now, now, Scott has moved on out or is, is graduating through the program? He was six months in re or five months in residential, and now he is in a three-month uh, aftercare program where he comes once a week. Okay. All right. So wh what would happen if I had a young child, a young uh, teenager, what have you, that mm -hmm. uh, was abusing? Mm-hmm and I brought them to you. Mm -hmm. what, what do you do? What are the steps? Well, the first step um, for our program is we give them a full assessment. We use an assessment called the GAIN, um, and we assess to see all the pieces of their life, their family life, legal history, biological, medical, and that gives us... So you us use a microscope to go look in oh, all yeah. aspects of mm -hmm. it, not just the child, but Correct. everybody else. Now, does the child move in to this uh, location? With residential, yes. They With move residential. in. Okay. Um, we have dorms upstairs. So that's based on your assessment, uh, yeah, how bad they the problem need, might be. Yeah, if they need a level of care of residential, if they're using to that extent, we don't think they have the support or the ability to stop using on their own through our outpatient program, mm -hmm. then we will put them in our residential program. So they go into that, how long would they be there? Average length of stay right now is five and a half to six months. Mm -hmm. We've got some kids who've made it through in four and a half months. They came in, they were ready, um, they worked real hard and did what they needed to do, and they were successfully discharged. We have other clients who, unfortunately, we do have to remove from the program. That or don't those do as well. That don't do as well. Um, we also have others who, it might take them six and a half to seven months, but they get there and then they're successfully discharged. So is there a, a, a recheck, a, a checks and balances afterwards after they've left that you know for sure? I mean, That's actually part of the program that Scotty's in. That's what that aftercare component is, okay. is the coming back in. And um, one thing I'm really proud of, of of our program and the staff at our facility is that the kids who have come through our doors so often come back. And I let the kids know that even if they're not successful, the door is still open. If they do leave our program and they relapse, they can still come in the lobby and ask for me or their counselor and we'll be available for them to touch base with us to help them. Is this common? Are you seeing uh, relapse occur oh, yeah. on a large... It's part of the recovery process. Okay. It truly is. 
Uh, I think Scotty had mentioned it, you know, that he relapsed when he uh, left the program because it is such a hard thing for adolescents to change the, the people, places, and things. To get those tools ingrained into them. Because at that change. age of life, friends are more important in that developmental piece of your life. The friend, your friends are more important than your family, and that's normal. And their life is based more on a temporary mm -hmm. uh, thing where we're looking at, into the future. So. Yeah, they're in the here and now. They're, in the they're here. not looking down the road. What, uh, what kind of advice do you give parents I come in, I bring in Johnny, and, and uh, you're now going to put Johnny into your residential program. What, mm -hmm. what do you tell me? What do I need to do? What do I need to change? Or That comes down the road. Usually when parents first come in, I, I thank them, and I just let them know <laughs> that their child will be safe and, and they're in a good place, and that I know it's scary, because it's very scary for the parent to leave their child. For all of the um, heartache and stress that they've gone through, mm -hmm. It is still one of the um, biggest fears of a parent is to walk out of a residential center leaving your child behind. It's a growth process for the families and the parents as well um, because they're hearing things that they've never believed or that they never thought were going on. Can't be my kid. Not my kid. No. Or I'm my kid's best friend. He tells me everything. So what do, what do you tell Do you tell them, I want you to go home and, and search the room or search areas you haven't searched before? We have told them that in some cases. Um, we have told them to get on MySpace if they know their kid's MySpace address. Um, the kids and their passes eventually when they work their way through the program, some of them will go with their parents and sit down and say, this was my MySpace address and this is how I want to change it and it becomes more of a collaboration with the parent. Um, it's, it's difficult because every parent's so different just like every kid's so different. But I still come back to the checks and balances though. Mm -hmm. How do you control that? Can't. You just can't. All, you know, I, I always tell my, my staff, all we do is plant seeds. That's all we can do, mm -hmm. is plant seeds to the, to the kids and to their parents and hope that the seeds that we plant will eventually sprout into, you know, a garden that's healthy. Does no willpower play into that? I mean, obviously, there's got to be something about peer pressure mm -hmm. when, when you're in high school and, mm -hmm. and that age. You see others. Uh, you see your older brother, you, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. I mean, that's just got to be unbelievable. One of the biggest challenges. It truly is. Um, you know, it's almost, you had even earlier made the, uh, the movement of, you know, you have that on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's a challenge. It's, it's one of the biggest challenges because, again, at that developmental stage of an adolescent, all you want to do is fit in and be popular. And so if that means being the dealer, if that means supplying the pills, then so often they'll do that. Well, what kind of recourse would, would someone have if, you know, listen, I'm getting this stuff at school. Mm -hmm. uh, is there recourse to, uh, to go and get these people eradicated? Or, or? Everywhere's so different. I mean, you know, that's more of the um, criminal justice end of sure. what goes on. And, right. and, you know, but do you play a role in that? We don't. We don't. I mean, we are purely, you know, the rehab piece. Yeah. We work with the kids on, we know that's going to be out there. But if you knew something, We've got, a, we've got a dangerous cocaine dealer or a dangerous mm -hmm. whatever it might be. You're not able to go and transfer that's, that Because of confidentiality, no. I got you. So we're not able to do that. What I can do, though, is work with my client on how to stay away from that kid, how mm -hmm. to cope with the pressures, how to watch the signs so that they don't get caught up in that mess again and they can make healthier choices. Because that's going to be out there. Sure. Realistically. And you're seeing this. You're seeing the results of this. Mm -hmm. What would you say we need to change in our society to uh, control this? Is, uh, are, is this just running rampant and, and free? It's running rampant, free, and, and it's taking over. Um, you know, you asked earlier, what are some of the changes I've seen? So often parents will just leave their, their drugs in their medicine chest or on the cabinet. Grandparents, etc. Grandparents, etc. Et mm -hmm. um, and the kids will take them, and it's, it's awareness. Um, actually, what PAR stands for is um, Operation Parental Awareness hmm. um, okay. and Responsibility. So a big piece of what we talk about is, re, you know, I don't want to say retraining, but educating parents on how to communicate with your kid, what to look for, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it could be more than just a parent. Yeah. A child might be living with a grandparent Correct. who has this enabling drug. Sure. Sure. We've so, got a number of kids, grandparents, aunt and uncles group mm -hmm. home, guardians. Um, so yeah, there's really, you know, it's not a cookie cutter anymore. It's, it's such blended the families nowadays. 
So what can a parent do to help their child when they find out what, what they need to do? Be aware and don't be afraid to talk to your kid like a parent. So many parents nowadays want to be their, their child's friend. And when things like this happen, it's not the time to be buddies. Um, it's the time to be honest and, and go, okay, this is what could happen. Or this is what has happened within our family, and maybe you need to be aware of this. So is it a discipline issue? Not perhaps? always a discipline issue. No. Um, my opinion is a lot of it is healthy communication. Being involved? Being very involved. Is that perhaps Being involved a big is, issue missing? I mean, something is a piece. Missing? You know, and part of that is, is the way our world is nowadays. You know, you've got mom and dad working, and you've got the older brother watching the, the younger siblings, and nobody's really home to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, cell phones, MySpace, Facebook. There's so many avenues out there that the kids garnish information from that so many adults are unaware right. of. They have no idea what MySpace is or Facebook. Or how to even get or to it. Or how to even get to it. No idea. And the kids are using these forms of communication. Is that the primary? I mean, are there other ways that they're using communication? Texting is huge. Uh, the cell phone texting mm -hmm. and, the, and the Internet. Are is, well, is that something a parent can find out? I mean, if their child is, is doing abnormal texting, can you, I mean, sure. are you able to, to research? Sure. Actually, you could go talk to your cell phone provider, and some of them will actually provide you um, texts that were printed out. The actual text. The actual texts. Um, so many parents find out after things have been going on for some time, you know, by the time the parent realizes that their child is, is doing drugs, the kid has been doing it for a year, if not more. And the kids are good at hiding. The boys explained earlier, right. oh, I told my mom I was going to go to the movies. Well, right. you know, no, they bought a dime bag of weed with that. Right. Um, so it's kind of the parents are always playing catch up. It seems they got to think out of the box. They have to think outside of the box. Be open. Have an open door policy. Not worry about being friend, um, but being honest with their child. Being honest. Honest. What would you, in, in just our closing moments here, and take the next minute, if you will, and just kind of give me a closing thought that's on your mind that you would love to tell as many people as you possibly can about your operation and about what we've discussed today about recovering from addiction? I would say don't minimize it. Don't take it lightly. Um, in my years with PAR, um, almost four now with Operation PAR, you know, I have watched five boys end up in the obituary after they've gone through or partially have gone through one of our counseling programs. Um, they couldn't do it. Um, in some cases, the parents were absent. And so that's one of the hardest parts of the job is that I do see kids that I know end up dying from their drug use. Nobody grows up wanting to be a drug addict, but it does kill, and not at a plan. So although it is a sombering thought, the reality is um, it can kill you, and it's not a game, and it needs to be dealt with and, and, and taken seriously. Very good. Well, that is all the time that we have. We're going to leave you with resource information for anyone who would like to have material about addiction recovery help in your area. On behalf of my guests, Scott, Garrett, Nick, and Mary Ellen Evers, I'm Stan Rhodes. Thank you for watching Recovering from Addiction, the Kids Perspective. Please stay safe, and we'll see you next time.